you, thank you. Now for something entirely different, at least from this morning. I want to start out with some ground truth, if I could, but I want to share with you, I didn't, I'd never heard of this conference, really, until I got the invitation, or just peripherally. And soon after, in 2000, when I published the book, Rare Earth, which suggested that aliens are perhaps far fewer than Carl Sagan would have us believe, or any night on TV, I was invited to a science fiction convention. So I said, sure, I was going to give a speech to anybody, and walked in. And instead of you that I saw, I saw a thousand Wookiees, Klingons, and aliens. <laughs> and I stood in front of them and said, there's no aliens. And they go, boo, of course there are. <laughs> and what do you say? <laughs> so today, I want to really have another operative word. It's something you're going to hear over the next five years over and over. And I think it's perhaps the most important word that is confronting us in our world. And the, world is, the word is methane. And try to get people to take you seriously when you say the world is going to change and it's methane. Well, the world has changed, and a lot to do with the change is methane. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about methane and what it has done. And also introduce the world's words clathrate and gas hydrates and other things about sudden climate change and past climate change. So hit it, boys. We live on this planet, and this planet is in a moment of time. And what really struck me about the presentations this morning was that we're really thinking about right now or next year or maybe 2029 when the shit really hits the fan. But we're not really thinking about the year 3000 in this conversation or 3 million AD or 30 million or 300 million or how about 3 billion years from now. So what I'd like to do is go way back in time and way forward in time and think about some of this stuff. And I'd like this talk to be evolutionary in a sense. And here we have our wonderful Charles Darwin, because he has given us, of course, the great paradigm for biology. But evolution is far more than a biological concept. And I like to think of Darwin as the first astrobiologist in a sense. There's a new sort of revolutionary thing taking place in NASA. It's no longer just engineering to build big pieces of hardware to throw them up in space. And there is a small cater of people in NASA that are trying to reclaim an intellectual high ground. And one of the really interesting areas there is the NASA Astrobiology Institute, which itself came about after the moon rock, or the Mars rock, I'm sorry, in 1996 was found. And Al Gore said, we have to really study life on Mars. And NASA, in response to that, put together a group of biologists and geologists and a whole bunch of different sciences. And they called themselves astrobiologists. And the major questions with the study of life's origin frequency in the universe, and especially frequency in our solar system, variety and fate of life. And we've heard about life on this planet. Well, one of the really interesting things that we do in this NASA Astrobiology Institute is first figure out how life formed on planet Earth. And my suggestion is that if we can figure out in a test tube how to make life, that an awful lot of the breakthroughs we want through biotechnology are going to be solved in that endeavor alone. But the second and more interesting endeavor now is that the National Academy of Sciences and NASA have combined together for a working group to study weird life. We hear a lot about aliens, but how weird can life be? If it's not DNA life, what can it be? Is DNA one type of life or the only type of life, or is there a whole different variety of ways? This is such an important pressing question, and yet so little has really been done upon it. My own sense is to start back in time. This was a, a diagram from Darwin's time. This is from Don Phillips, where the first term, Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, were first coined. But more interesting to me, this is the world's first diversity through time diagram. We start on the right side of this picture, the Cambrian explosion, and then we have this weird old Paleozoic, and then a crash, and then a middle group of life, and then a crash and then a modern group. And what's interesting about this diagram, not only do we have the first time that mass extinctions, wholesale times when life disappeared in large numbers are introduced, but we have a sense that there's more life now than any time in the past. And this has been an operative principle in biology for years. This is over 140 years old, this diagram. A more modern view is reversed now, where the Cambrian is on the far left side and the modern day is on the right, it's pretty much the same thing, the same view. We had this explosion of metazoans 540 million years ago. The formation of shells, as Greg said, is certainly one of the drivers. And yet if we look at taxonomic diversity, there's more now than any time in the past. And I say this has always given me comfort 
See, things are getting better. We're getting older, but there's more of us. <laughs> but I'd really like to ask, could this be true? And in response to this, I wrote Rare Earth with Don Brownlee, and secondly, a second book, The Life and Death of Planet Earth, and we wanted to think about habitable planets. The first book was about where they are in space, but the second, we started realizing we'd really missed part of the story, because a habitable planet, like our lives, is finite. There's a first formation where habitability occurs, and habitability is where life can live on it, at least life as we know it, and it must end in some sense, like our own lives. And so the second book was asking, how long will Earth be like that picture that I started this with? This is what happens when you make a PowerPoint slide <laughs> and transfer it to an Apple computer. I mean, this is Bill's revenge, right? But this slide was set up to show really the good and the bad and the worst of the three terrestrial planets that really had any likelihood of having life on them. So as bad as Mars is, Venus is worse. And the sense here is that what we're looking at in Earth and Venus now are two twins. One a little bit too close. It lost its habitability. And it lost its habitability in something called runaway greenhouse, where you have 800 degrees centigrade surface temperatures, and that's not a great place to be. Mars, as bad as it is, at least you can walk around on it without being snuffed out by the heat. And Earth, of course, is good. But good in what sense? Good now. It wasn't good in the past, and it won't be good in the future. And the question we have is, how long will it be good? Good so that people like you and I can sit here and think about how we can genetically engineer our children. Sorry, Greg, I had to do it. You didn't think I was going to take it sitting down, did you? All right. Everybody in this room, with a few exceptions I know, is going to die. <laughs> you have two ways that that's going to happen. If you lead a good life and take all those vitamins and the fatty acid stuff that everybody raised their hands, you might live and die of old age. But the second is, you walk out of this room and you might get hit by a truck, or a lightning bolt, or a piece of that Chinese satellite that they said they successfully got down. So accidental death is one way in which life does end. And it's certainly a way that life on planet Earth could come to an end. I want to start there first. Diversity on life could come to an end accidentally through a comet or asteroid impact. We all loved Hale-Bopp back in the late 90s, had that comet, which was about 40 kilometers in diameter, hit us. There'd be plenty of bacteria, but not a single animal alive on this planet. But there's other bad stuff, supernova, the climate goes bad, and finally human caused stuff. Runaway nanotechnology, runaway robotics, boredom, I don't know, there's a lot of possibilities. <laughs> so let's start with the one we do know about, and what the best known of all the past accidental ways you could die that came close to an accidental death was at the end of the Cretaceous 65 million years ago. And we can go to a place in Italy. This is the spot where Walter Alvarez in the late 70s, and this is his student, Alessandro Montanari, examining that white layer, discovered that we were hit 65 million years ago. And this particular slide, I think, is wonderful because it shows how short-term an asteroid impact extinction can be. Well, you'll all turn into geologists here. For scale, we always have the hammer for scale. I don't know why. It's just one of the things you have to do. And the rocks we have here are chalk. Chalk is made up of about 90% the skeletons of coccolithophorids, a small plant that floats in the surface waters. It dies, its skeleton falls to the bottom, and the sediment of that sea is made up almost exclusively of something made from life. And then you find a thin red layer, and that red layer is absolutely packed with tiny little tectites, little spherules of glass, and among it a lot of iridium, and other little bits and pieces of Mexico. In this particular case, this slide comes from Europe, so this is Mexico come to Europe on a permanent vacation. <laughs> but what's more instructive is above that, look, you've got those black sediment. Now, where's that coming from? That black sediment is sediment that has been deposited in the absence of life. There's no plankton left on the planet but for a few survivor species to drop their little skeletons down. And near the top of the slide, it goes white again because life re-evolves. And from the red to the top of that slide is about 10,000 years. Now, the emplacement of that red layer, which killed off 60% of species on this planet, took days to at most a week 
who are looking at a global catastrophe that cleans off the majority of species in days to a week. So this is really scaled upward a way that we could clean out this planet. And there are plenty of comets out there. You've seen it in the movies, you know. <laughs> and there cannot be a sequel because Bruce Willis died at the end. Chemically, we can see this. We see there's an extinction. We see, in this particular case, enhancement of iridium. And unless this was a really awful coincidence, which really no one suggests now is the case, asteroid impacts can indeed kill life, and it does so suddenly. So this is perhaps the most common way that you can kill off a planet. The comets are the most dangerous denizens of the solar system to human endeavor. They come in fast, and they come in with velocity sufficient to boil away seas. It's happened in the past, it can happen in the future. The 65 million year old impact happened in, as we know, the Yucatan Peninsula. Impact waves scoured much of Texas. Would it happen right now? Perhaps it would get all the way to Crawford, I don't know. I gave this speech, this comment, this slide in Italy to 2,500 Italians, and they stood up and gave a standing ovation. <laughs> and they started chanting, kill Bush, kill Bush. I had no idea at that point, up to that point last year, the depths of animosity over there. Well, it's not just comets in space. It's also other bad things can happen. And the most important of these are supernova. Supernova we know have happened in recent times. This is the Crab Nebula. This was observed by humans. The lethal radius of a supernova is 30 light years. If you're within that envelope, you have your ozone stripped off at the least extreme. and the most extreme, you're hit with enough hard charging particles to kill life directly. So these are very dangerous things. <laughs> but as any real estate person will tell you, location, location, location. <laughs> And it turns out we calculate that there are better and worse places to be in the galaxy. And we happen to be in a very good one. And this is as glib as the slide is, at least the first scientific presentation that we made of what we now call the galactic habitable zone. And we think the galaxies, spiral galaxies themselves, have good real estate. And the real estate is bounded by two edges. The first is metallicity. Do you have enough metals? Astronomers are crazy enough to say a metal is anything heavier than helium, so just bear with me. <laughs> it's true, I'm an astronomer now, so I know. Do you have enough metallicity to make a Earth-like planet? And the outer fringes of the galaxy don't. But in the interior, these common impacts, the supernova, are much more dangerous. It turns out Earth has had a very benign history. We only have one major impact in the last 500 million years, and that's one of the things I'll try to tell you today. The biggest mass extinction is not this thing in the Maastrichtian here that killed off the dinosaurs, but it was 250 million years ago, and this is where methane enters. I've been studying in South Africa about 10 years, and this picture is ironic to me because there are four members of a family killed in about four years. Mom and Dad are in this gravestone over here. Two sons on either side all died in four years, about the year 1900. You go back to the records in the area, you cannot find what killed these people. It was probably the British in the Boer War, because these were good Boers. And so here we've got a 100-year-old mass extinction of a family, and there just isn't a record keeping on this planet that can tell us what happened. But the irony to me is they put their graveyard right on a much older graveyard, the limit between the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic. This is the Great Permian extinction. 90% extinction of creatures on the planet, not 50 or 60 like that minor little dinosaur event. So up to five years ago, we would have said, well, ha, it's just a bigger asteroid than that and killed the, the dinosaurs. And this has been the paradigm, of course. The other aspect is that the victims of this mass extinction are unknown to us culturally. This is one of the greatest and most ferocious and interesting carnivores to have ever been on the planet. This is one of your relatives. This is a mammal-like reptile called a Gorgonopsian, or a Gorgon for short. It's about the size of a lion, except it probably has scales. Big squat, it was part mammal, part not mammal, so therapsid, a mammal-like reptile. It is part of a huge empire of creatures killed off by this mass extinction. They're not dinosaurs. <laughs> but they could be. This is my son Patrick, and this is called paleontological child abuse. 
Dad, no! Ah! This is the size of a dinosaur-like creature. And it illustrates the enormity of not only the creatures, but their diversity. But the surprising thing to me is that we just have no record of them. And yet this is the group that gave rise to us. Immediately before mammals, you had mammal-like reptiles. They were killed off by this mass extinction. And the mass extinction itself was not a sudden blow from space. But in fact, it was something much more hideous. It was caused by methane. This is a greenhouse extinction. And only in the last year or two have we come to grips with understanding how rapidly atmospheres can change and how dangerous they could be. At that time, the continents had all come together in a juxtaposition. You were in junior high school when you first thought about that spooning of South America and Africa? <laughs> yeah. How could that possibly be, unless there was some sort of strange something going on? But the very strangest part of this is new work that's come out of Yale University. And this graph, I think, is extremely important in my own field. Two things we should see here. The red is carbon dioxide. We see the history of carbon dioxide over the last 600 million years. It's not straight line, but rather it's been a crash, it rose again, and it crashed. And the irony is that at this point, at zero, carbon dioxide is far lower than it's been almost any other time in our planet's history. And the second is oxygen, and this is far more interesting to me. On the right is our present day oxygen, 21%. And look what happens to 200 million years ago. It crashes down to 11%. Every place on the planet is at 14,000 feet 200 million years ago. Now, birds happen to fly at very high altitudes. You can see birds at 30,000 feet. Any mammal is going to die at 30,000 feet. And next week, I'm going to give the first evidence that I think the dinosaurs are on this planet simply because they developed low oxygen lungs. Birds have air sacs throughout their body. Dinosaurs, we now know, have the same thing. Birds are consummate low oxygen creatures. They do great at high oxygen, but 200 million years ago, their ancestors, which is related to this particular T-Rex here, lived in a world where oxygen was at 11% and then rose back up again. The age of dinosaurs is not because you had this great big tooth thing that worked well. It is because it is a creature designed for a low oxygen world. We are going to rewrite the history a life on this planet over the next five years, and the operative word is methane. Because it is methane that caused this. Subduction is one of the reasons the Earth remains habitable, but subduction also leads to volcanism. Volcanism produces huge amounts of CO2. CO2 warms an atmosphere. There is dissolved methane all through sediments. They're called clathrates. If you warm them, the methane comes out. Methane, when it hits the atmosphere, turns into CO2, and when it does so, Every mole of methane turning into CO2 takes a mole of oxygen to do it. When you have methane going up, oxygen goes down. These mass extinctions were triggered by low oxygen events associated with huge volcanism. We're going back to that. This is the old Permian world. The low methane event or high methane event was related to continents coming together. The Wilson cycle says that in 250 billion years, we're going to do it again. So let's now use a box model and try to understand atmosphere and relate it back to tectonics. Solar luminosity is the driver, really, and each of these arrows means a positive feedback. The circles are a negative feedback. So most of these feedbacks, which we can actually mo model mathematically, can give us a sense of, based on tectonics, what's going to happen to the most important thing that we want to know about, which is the green, global biological productivity. Productivity is the rate at which carbon is fixed. It goes from CO2 to biological matter. Based on that box model, a number of groups at different universities have now come to a number of estimates. And I apologize for the nastiness of the slide, but raw scientific data has its own charms. <laughs> Here we are at zero. That's the present day. That's back through time. This is the future. Now, in the first data slide of this talk, I showed you that wonderful, good, warm feeling there's more and more species through time. Let's not think about species diversity. Let's think about life, how much life is on the planet. And if these models are correct, we're dying. Our planet has seen its best days. Its best days, as a matter of fact, happened back at about the start of the Paleozoic. By every measure, the amount of productivity on the planet is plummeting and will hit zero about a half billion years from now. And when it hits zero, some really nasty things 
will tend to happen. The second driver is the sun. The sun is getting warmer and warmer and warmer. We have maintained a constant temperature through time because of plate tectonics. I would argue that if you go search for habitable worlds, look for linear mountain chains. Linear mountain chains can only be built by plate tectonics. Only plate tectonics can give you a feedback system allowing constant temperature through time. No other system on the planet will do that. Even with this feedback system that we have, at about a half billion to a billion years from now, we're going to have a runaway temperature. And the Earth is going to go into temperatures that you and I would find unpleasant. So let's think about a way that the world will end. A chrono chronological end is the first, which I'll end this talk with, is the end of the interglacial. But then in sequence, we can predict there'll be an end of plant life, animals, loss of the oceans. I mean, what is this called, sea change? Well, that's a sea change for you. <laughs> no more oceanographers. Oh, we've thrown that discipline away. The end of all life on Earth, and the enlarging sun envelops the Earth. Loss of carbon dioxide. I showed you a slide where it's dropping down, and this seems so ironic in this world now where we can't join Kyoto. But in reality, this really will kill our world. And what happens is when we get to 10 ppm, plants die. 20 million years after the last plant, you lose all your oxygen. Because we have so much reductance coming out of the volcanoes that the oxygen is just used up 20 million years. We can already see the results of this. Plants on the planet have been C3 plants, the type of photosynthesis, all the way till about 15 million years ago. And then CO2 dropped sufficiently to cause natural selection and evolution to build a new type called a C4 plant. C4 plants are mostly grasses and grains. C3 plants are most of the tropical vegetation and trees that we see. This is a response already to the dying planet. The Earth is indeed a world that is changing radically and rapidly, and we can see it all around us by simply looking at the plants around you. The second big problem is heat limits for life. There are no hot metazoans. There are no thermophilic metazoans. 45 to 50 degrees centigrade is about the limit. Well, perhaps evolution will build hot animals, but it does not seem structurally possible. The end of the age of animals is going to be a real interesting time as well. This talk was built as future evolution, and here we might see lots of interesting. These are paintings by my great friend Alexis Rockman. This is what some of the future of the evolution may be in this super hot world. But personally, I think a more realistic view is something like this. Because what we have done now is modify the world. And what we see quite often, the results of the human world, shown here by this garbage layer, are going to be runaway weeds. But especially those genes that were talked about so wonderfully this morning, escaping from the laboratories and turning animals, the domesticated animals, and especially plants, into entirely new types of creatures, those resistant to pesticide, those that have genes modified for crops that do escape, and it will happen. So the final aspect of this talk is let's look at the tree of life. This is what we see now. We have these three major domains, the Archaeans, the bacteria, and the eukaryons. As all these ends come about, what do we see? Well, we're going to see a radical pruning of this. So we're here, down here next to corn, well, we lose the corn, and there's us, and it'll end up like this. So the Earth, which has been this wonderful promise of evermore, is in fact, at this moment, turning into ever less. But it's not going to be the end of life. It's simply going to be the end of the age of animals. So the hopeful view is that we animals are a sandwich between Oreos of a bacterial world. We're that white filling, and we're a very narrow white filling. We had three and a half billion years of bacterial world. We've had a half billion years of animals, another half billion years of animals. Then we've got this long time of another bacterial world. We go back to planet yogurt. <laughs> and here they are. The last animals are gone, but the last life isn't. For billions of years, you have this. This is taken from a kilometer deep in the Columbia River, Hanford Reserve. These are bacteria deep in rock. Even as the surface becomes sterilized for life, the bacteria can still live in the subsurface, at least for a while. Well, the final end of it is going to be 12 billion years after our sun started. So 7 billion years from now, the sun enlarges and suddenly pulses into a red giant phase. It'll expand to the orbit of the Earth and consume the Earth, and then have a series of pulses. 
And we can predict pretty accurately how this will come about through physics. And then we'll be something like this, postcard from planet Earth. And my friend Don Brownlee actually printed up thousands of these, which he happily throws about to anybody who will take them. So let's go a step back now and get away from the far future. That seems irrelevant for this particular conference. But let's look at something that might be relevant. And this messy diagram is ice cores. These come from ice in Antarctica, the Vostok core. And what we're looking at here is age, time, 200,000 years on the right, zero on the left, and temperature and CO2. We are now, as you can see in the far left, at a time with carbon dioxide, even in that old slide, it's less than 300. We're up to 360 now. But you'll notice that over the last 200,000 years, times with CO2, times when we have warm temperatures, are a minority. There has been 10,000 years of warm and 90,000 years of cold. And we are ready for the cold again. But for human intervention, we should now be returning back to the glaciers. I would submit to you that the worst thing that can happen to human civilization is another glaciation. Far worse than a highly warmed world is a cold world. The cold world, you can't fly jets, it's too much dust. I mean, right there, there's a reason not to have it. <laughs> the second way you have enough dust in the air and climate change, you can't grow grain. It's a very, very distinctly different type of world. We also know that the last time that we had a glaciation and it came out of it, we lost 50 species of large animals in North America. Here's the American mastodon. We have seen the disappearance of animals by human technology that is no more complicated than a stone on a stick. I'd like to leave you with this view. This is from, again, Alexis. And the one fate that awaits us is perhaps the left side, the glaciation. But the other is the right. And I'd also submit to you that the next election for president may be one of the most important in the history of democracy. Because although we concentrate on Iraq, what is happening to our atmosphere and our environment, I think ultimately we'll have a much harder harder fate for life on the planet. It is this right-hand view of super globally warmed world that scares me mostly. I have a kid. I live in Seattle, Washington. There's no malaria there. The models that we have now suggest that 150 years from now, we have 1,000 parts per million CO2. That takes us back to the Eocene. The Eocene was a time when there was no circulation in the oceans. Because it's so hot, you don't have a change Global warming doesn't make the tropics any warmer. It makes the poles warmer. And so all this nonsense on TV about the globally warmed world and all the superstorms, that's crap. When you don't have a cold poles and a hot equator, you don't have the export of heat. Heat causes the storms. We go into a totally calm world. And in the calm world, organic material falls to the bottom of the oceans and produces methane. And hot worlds just get hotter. Diseases get exported north, and we're turned into a world very quickly that's so radically different than our own, I don't think any of us in this room will understand it. We are looking at that in 150 years max. So with that pleasant thought, I think we should all end up singing our favorite REM song. It's the end of the world as I know it. But first of all, I don't want to take it. Thank you. Thank you. Come out here. We've got some questions for you. we got some questions. We have right down here. Can we have the... Who should we vote for? <laughs> Is that your question? <laughs> Ask them what they want to do with Kyoto. Other than walk away from it. <laughs> to start. It's an important election, so we have to find somebody to vote for. Really, it's not going to be perfect. Well, if I have to tell you that... <laughs> Okay, right over here. Chris Anderson, do you view intelligence as just another evolutionary trick, kind of of similar status to an elephant's trunk or ants' ability to do what they do? Or um, do you take the view that some people do that that will itself change the history of some of what you're talking about? That if an asteroid arrives, say, in 50 years' time, it may never hit because intelligence will deal with it, et cetera. This is a great point. What I've dealt with in this talk is predictable things. And for, interestingly enough, it's far more realistic to model a billion years from now than it is a thousand years from now because of that intelligence. Humans are not predictable. I mean, that's clearly the case. 
Intelligence itself, however, is, is a commodity in a sense. It is something that exists. High intelligence, and the definition of SETI and the astronomer community is that intelligence, that's all they think about is intelligence, is something that can build a radio telescope. That's their definition. So otherwise, you can't communicate with them. How many times have civilizations arisen in our particular galaxy? How many are there now? And this, of course, is the basis of the Drake equation. This is one of the most interesting of all questions. How many alien civilizations are there? But when we look at the number of species on planet Earth, if there's 10 million now, if we take back the record, there may have been a billion species on this planet. The ability to build a radio telescope has arisen in one species out of a billion, perhaps. Now, being intelligent, is a pretty good thing. But being very intelligent is a very bad thing because nervous tissue is a terrible drag if it's huge, like ours is. It's not a very good tissue to have to keep oxygenated, to keep fed. It becomes a liability. Being smart like a cat is a good thing. Being smart like a human in an evolutionary sense appears not to be such a good thing. There's all kinds of special stuff that has to happen. So the sense is that perhaps animals arise and we get up to a certain level of intelligence. But how often it turns into radio telescope intelligence, I think, is vastly more rare than has been suggested, at least by the science fiction fraternity and some astronomers. Let's go to the balcony. You want to go down here? Balcony? <laughs> I'm Josh Gibson from Presque Isle. And I was wondering just how much of an influence humans have had on the methane levels that we have now. We're far more important in producing carbon dioxide but the leading producers of methane on the planet right now are rice fields and cows. And rice fields because the rice is a tubular structure and all the methanogenic bacteria around it get bypassed. So a, a rice plant is a chimney. They build methane because they put water over the roots. They put, they put uh, a soil level on it. The oxygen cannot form. You turn it anaerobic. Methane goes right out that chimney. Cows and beaver ponds are other large scale. The cows themselves are huge. The rate of increase of greenhouse gases is unprecedented in the history of the world. We know that. There's never been a rise as rapidly as we've just done. We are conducting a global experiment in a crude, crude fashion, the results of which will become apparent only within the next century to a thousand years. Over here. Yeah, in, the, uh, in your historic analysis, um, does that admit any of the lovelock Gaia hypothesis in terms of any of those changes that happened, for example, in the, in the increase in methane and the, and the diversity represent any support for that hypothesis or none at all? From your My next book is going to be called Anti-Gaia. <laughs> <laughs> because I have any number, any, any, just looking at the fossil record gives you any sense. There are two snowball Earth episodes, one of 2.3 billion and one of 650 million. Both of these were brought about by Plants Gone Wild. It could be a new video. <laughs> <laughs> Runaway crazy evolution and changes the climate to the point that we froze the planet twice. Now, no good Gaian, Mother Gaia, would not let herself be nearly frozen to death. And this was the consequence of evolutionary change. Gaian work has spawned an enormous amount of good science and an enormous amount of bad religion. And you need to separate the two. Over here. Hi, Greg Stock. Hey, Greg. Uh, hi there. All right. Oh, you we tricked go. us by moving around in the audience. <laughs> okay, I tricked you. <laughs> the, it seems to me that your advocacy of the Kyoto Protocol, it really flies in the face of what you're saying. Because if you really care about moving back to the Eocene, then it seems to me that the Kyoto Protocol is a joke and that it does not really do anything but delay the arrival of that by maybe a generation or a couple of generations. Whereas what you should be advocating would be a switch towards nuclear power or towards, you know, a massive change in the way that we're, the power structure in, this, in the world rather than something as a half measure like the Kyoto. My suggestion would be the future of the world's atmosphere resides in two places, India and China. In the next, this will be the century of Asia, because that is where the middle class is going to be. First of all, we've exported our middle class jobs there. And secondly, the population increases of the planet are, are highest there. So an automobile technology that is coming out of those two areas is going to be run largely by coal. Although there's oil in China, there's a whole lot more coal. And so coal filed technology is going to run the emergent technologies that I see in India and China. 
And so I think you're right in the sense that, yes, maybe we, we should scrap Kyoto, but we've got to play for time. And at least this says we're doing something as the entire planet. Every one of these things that I've talked about in this talk in the future can be bioengineered away. And by the bioengineers, I mean us. Technology can handle the drop in CO2. There is no biological reason that our species cannot be there to see that 500 million year from now catastrophe. I have dived with the chambered nautilus, a species that's 500 million years old. There's no reason we have to go extinct. Okay. We can bioengineer our way out of it. On the balcony? Oh, oh, you didn't? Oh, I'm sorry, I saw, I saw your sign. That was great. I, uh, I had a simple question. Uh, could you comment on what caused the 10,000-year uh, cycle of hot to cold on the planet? You know, it's more than 10. It's, it's a 1090-1090, and this is mostly Milankovitch. These are orbital perturbations of the planet, how we line up with the sun, and when we get a little bit warmer and a lot colder. And we should have at least another 2 million years of this warm, cold, warm, cold. Well, humans have circumvented that. I mean, there's not going to be any more cold as long as there's human civilization. Our challenge is to stay the middle ground. We need to try to keep the world where it is now because the globally warm world is a disaster to civilization. The ice world is a disaster to civilization. We can do wonders to genomes, but, you know, that thermostat, we only have the crudest way. We hardly know how the thermostat works. We have to be able to have the fine tuning on a thermostat to keep ourselves in the middle ground. As a, if we want to maintain a civilization that builds computers, you've got to have that. Peter Ward, thank you.